You might want to turn to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, we're going to read verses 28 through 30 in just a moment. Ladies, if you missed the Women's Renewal Weekend, you missed a fantastic weekend, right, ladies? I heard it was fantastic. Beverly Ross had wonderful messages. It was a time of great fellowship and sharing. And I know that our, our women were inspired and encouraged and challenged. And so let me encourage you to make sure you keep uh, that on your calendar for next year. And we're thankful that God used the weekend to encourage our women. Let me ask you to bow as we pray this morning. God, we're so very thankful for a great weekend that uh, was just completed with the Women's Renewal Seminar. And God, we thank you for lives that were changed, for hearts that were moved. We thank you, God, for the power of your word to change us, to morph us, to change us into the people that you want us to be through the power of your Holy Spirit. Open our eyes today, widen our horizons, lift our eyes Help us to trust you more deeply for the work that you will accomplish through your Son and through your Spirit. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Romans 8, verses 28 through 30. Paul says, And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. For God knew his people in advance, and he chose them to become like his Son, so that his son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And having chosen them, he called them to come to him. And having called them, he gave them right standing with himself. And having given them right standing, he gave them his glory. Romans 8, 28, one of the most famous verses in all the Bible. God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love him. Another translation says, in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. Really? 20 years ago when our special needs daughter Hannah was born, it didn't seem that way. We had seen the sonograms. We knew she was going to have serious issues. She was born with a birth defect known as an encephalocele. There were two very large cysts on the back of her head, one about the size of a football. They had to be surgically removed. She was born in a hospital in Plano, and then she was transported to Medical City in Dallas. I can still remember the look on the face of one of the emergency workers. She was in a little plastic bassinet being put into the ambulance, and I looked at him, and, and he saw her, and then he looked into my eyes with tremendous compassion because he knew just with one look that this little girl was going to face serious issues. And so Hannah was born with a, a loss of a lot of her brain. And that meant that she would not be able to walk for the first three years of her life. She was in a wheelchair for those first three years because the part of her brain that affects balance was basically lost. It also meant that Hannah would not be able to talk. We call Hannah our little wordless one. She's never spoken one word, probably never will. She finds ways to communicate to us, but it's, it's always a challenge. And she is extremely dependent. She can't brush her own teeth. She can't bathe herself. Uh, she can't dress herself. Uh, for the most part, she can't toilet herself. And so she's extremely dependent on other people. She will always be that way. Chances are, within a year or two, we will be facing the prospect of putting Hannah in a, a group home where other people will have to care for her. There are ongoing challenges, like taking her to the dentist. Some of you have heard me talk about this. Hannah and I had another visit with the dentist this week. And it's like roping a calf, because she is not at all excited about being in the dental chair. Most of us are not, but she's especially resistant. And the dentist and the hygienist and I all work together. We don't need any workout for the rest of the week because we get all the exercise we need right then because the hygienist is holding Hannah's head as tightly as she can and the dentist is working as quickly as he can to make sure that she's not jerking her head and poking her eye out with one of those instruments. And, and I'm there, I'm holding her down, doing all that I can with literally all the strength that I've got. I'm holding her down, trying to make sure she stays in that chair. And there are times when she is screaming at the top of her lungs. She has occasional meltdowns like that. If you're in Kroger and you hear somebody screaming, it's probably Hannah. 
And so there are all kinds of challenges. And all things God works for the good of those who love him. Really? Of course, you can tell your own stories. Maybe the story of a parent who has dementia, who doesn't know who you are, who he is, doesn't know where they are. Or maybe the story of an accident that emptied your savings and stole your health. Maybe the story of a flood that invaded your home and almost literally washed your home down the river. Every person in this room could describe some kind of disappointment or heartache or tragedy that left you heartbroken. And it caused you to wonder, do all things really work together for good to those who love God? Now, I can't speak for you, but I can speak for us. And I can tell you in the case of Hannah and our experience with her, it's absolutely true that in all things God works for the good of those who love him. I've experienced more spiritual growth as a result of our experience with Hannah than any other single experience in my life. God has helped me grow in my love. I love Hannah so much that there are days when I think, you know, if the only thing I could do for the rest of my life would just be to take care of her 24-7, I could do that, and I could do that with joy, and I would be very fulfilled. God has taught me lessons in patience. There are times when I think, I cannot take another dirty diaper. Times when, when Hannah just tests my patience more and more, and so God just keeps pushing that limit of my patience out there. He keeps growing me in patience. There are times when God uses Hannah to teach me lessons in trust. When I wonder, now who's going to take care of Hannah next? Who's going to be there for her when I'm not going to be able to be there? But God unfailingly provides the people that I need. And so I learn lessons in trust. God has used Hannah to teach me lessons in prayer. She can't talk, but I firmly believe that God hears her prayers and sometimes I can't find a way to communicate what it is that I'm trying to get over to God, but I know that he hears me, and so God teaches me lessons in prayer. Now, you might not know it in your experience yet, but you need to hold on to that promise of Scripture because Scripture is always true, and all things God works for the good of those who love him, those who are called according to his purpose. God uses painful experiences to shape us. Troubles transform us. Misfortunes morph us. Difficult situations shape us. And this morning I want to take you to this great text, just three verses. We're going to deal with each one in succession, and there's a very powerful promise attached to each one of these verses. And you might want to jot these down. Principle number one, God works in all things for your good. He works in all things for your good. Look at verse 28 again. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. I want you to notice three things about that verse. First, Paul does not say bad things won't happen in your life. He doesn't say bad things are not going to happen. In fact, that's one of the reasons why he writes this text. Basically, he writes Romans chapters 5 through 8 to encourage people who will suffer, who will go through adversity. God doesn't promise that Christians will be exempt from suffering. He doesn't promise you that you will be immune from pain. You know, sometimes that's one of our issues. We, we're faithful to God. We try to honor God. We try to love God. And then something bad happens in our lives, and we scratch our head, and we say, why is this happening to me? But the reality is God never promised that you would be exempt from pain. And we said it last week. Disillusionment is the product of illusion. We have to scuttle those illusions that cause us to believe that nothing bad is going to happen in our lives. The reality is, tough things will happen in your life. Paul wants to get you ready for that. He wants to get me ready for that. He wants to give us this big picture. He wants us to remember John 16, where Jesus says, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I've overcome the world. So there will be disappointment, there will be heartache, there will be pain, but make sure you understand that you're not exempt from pain. And then Paul does say, secondly about this verse, God works for the good of those who love him. He works for the good of those who love him. Tim Keller says that Romans 8.28 is a blessing box verse. You know what a blessing box verse is? 
It's one of those verses that we seize on in Scripture, and we take it out of context, and we ignore what happens before it, what's after that verse, and then we put it in our blessing box. It's kind of like some of those verses that you see in the coffee mugs in Christian bookstores. You know, it's kind of a half-truth, but it's not entirely what we sometimes say it is. So sometimes we look at this verse and we say, well, what this means is when something bad happens, then inevitably something good is going to follow it, as we define good. Well, I lost the opportunity for this job. That means that a better job has to be waiting for me. I lost the chance to be in attendance at this grad school. That means that automatically a better grad school is waiting for me. Sometimes that's true. Sometimes that's true, but it's not always true. You see, our problem is maybe our definition of good. Because we tend to define good in terms of smooth sailing, easy going, health, wealth, prosperity, all the things that we would define as good. And again, sometimes those are the kinds of things that, that accrue in our lives as we love God, but not always. You see, what God defines as good is you growing into the image of Christ and God being glorified. But it doesn't always equate with health, wealth, and prosperity. So somebody says, well, you know, you lost that job because God's got a better job waiting for you. Or don't fret over the fact that your fiancé canceled the engagement because, because uh, that means God has a better life partner waiting for you. Well, that could be. But it's not necessarily the case. God might shake you out of a job that's well-paying because he needs to shake you out of a materialistic lifestyle. Or he might free you from that, that person to whom you're engaged so that you can spend the rest of your life in serving him more fully in a single life. We have to be very, very careful about our definition of what is good. I think uh, Bruce Wilkerson puts it well, or Brian Wilkerson. He says, Romans 8, 28 does not say everything that happens is good. It doesn't even say that all things work together for good. No, it says that God works in all things, good and bad, to accomplish his purpose. He works. It's the image of the strong hand of a potter taking a piece of clay that looks like nothing and working it over with skill and strength to fashion it into something beautiful. God works in all the events of our lives to accomplish his eternal purpose. John Ortberg talks about motivations for prayer and demotivations for prayer. And he says, one of the greatest motivations for prayer is answered prayer. You know, when you pray and things turn out the way that you have asked them to turn out, that's maybe the greatest motivation for prayer. And then he talks about the greatest demotivator for prayer, which is what? Unanswered prayer, right? When we feel like we pray and things don't turn out the way that we want, but sometimes unanswered prayers, so-called unanswered prayers, turn out to be great blessings. I went through a mental list this week of some of the things that have turned out to be good in my life, even though they didn't match my original prayers. I'm thankful that God turned me away from law school and toward ministry. I'd have to be an object of all those bad lawyer jokes, you know? I'm thankful that God spared me from being wealthy. About 27 years ago, I was on the cusp of becoming a wealthy man, and apparently God knew that that wealth would not be good for me. In fact, he might have known that it would have destroyed me spiritually. I'm thankful for the promise of early success that didn't always pan out because it gave me a humbler sense of reality. I'm thankful for disappointments in my life that have made me more dependent upon God. I'm thankful for those unanswered prayers. You know, Garth Brooks had that song years ago, Unanswered Prayers, you remember? And he talks about this, this guy who, you know, he, he uh, meets this girl at his reunion, and he had prayed that she would become his wife, and then he sees her years later, and he is thanking God for unanswered prayers. <laughs> I went to my college reunion years ago, and I saw a girl that I'd been nuts about in college. And again, that prayer was being whispered, thank God 
I know because I heard her whisper it. <laughs> you see, God might know that you don't need stuff, that you need to learn the message of generosity, so maybe he, he takes you through a time that's lean financially. Or maybe God knows that you need to learn the lesson of deferred gratification, so he makes you wait. Or he knows that you need to learn the lesson of humility, so he places you in obscurity. Or God knows that you need to learn better how to love people who are tough to love, and so he puts difficult people around you. We think Christians should be excluded from suffering, but the reality is suffering is one of the greatest tools of God to help us grow. Go back to Romans 5, verses 3 through 5. Paul says, suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character, character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Notice the progression. Suffering, endurance, character, hope, and love. But it starts with suffering. People who love God have always had trouble. I mean, you think about Joseph in the Old Testament. At the age of 17, his brothers sell him into slavery because they're jealous of him. He's taken by a slave caravan to Egypt. He goes through all kinds of difficulties and hardships. And then finally, he gets into Potiphar's house. Potiphar's wife, probably a very beautiful woman, tries to seduce him every single day. He says, no. How could I do this great evil and sin against my God? And for his faithfulness, what reward does he get? He gets falsely accused of rape and thrown into a dungeon. But then finally he's elevated to the position of second in command over all Egypt. And 20 years after this misfortune happens in his life, he meets with his brothers. And he says in Genesis 50 verse 20, which is really the Old Testament version of Romans 8, 28, what you intended for evil, God intended for good. The very trouble that was introduced into his life was used by God to bring him to a position of leadership and a position of greatness for God. Or you think about the Apostle Paul. He's got this thorn in the flesh. We don't know exactly what it was. Maybe poor vision because he writes in one of his letters about, see with what large letters I write this with my hand. Whatever it was, it's a, it's a difficult thing for Paul. And he prays. He says, God, please take this away. And he goes into three intense seasons of prayer, begging God to take away whatever this thorn is. And God says no. And the reason he says is because I want to keep you from being conceited. And then God says to Paul in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 10, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. My power is made perfect in weakness. Our weakness is the occasion for God's strength. And Paul will even say in Philippians 3, verse 10, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his suffering. So you can have one of two attitudes toward your suffering. You can let it make you bitter or you can let it make you better. You can shake your fist at God, you can complain, you can argue, or you can lean into your suffering and ask, what is it that God might be able to teach me? And truthfully, sometimes I'm convinced God is not really trying to teach you anything. It could be he's going to use your suffering for somebody else. That somebody else is going to be able to witness your nobility, your character, your strength, your faith in the middle of suffering, and that's going to be a witness to them of the power of Christ in you. So people who love God have always had trouble. I've talked with you a lot about Johnny Tata. She's been in a wheelchair since the age of 16. But her faith is so resilient, so brilliant, and she challenges those who suffer. She challenges those who suffer but have not claimed God's promise to be able to leverage tough things into good. She says, maybe you need to pray these words, Lord Jesus, I have not allowed my suffering to draw me to you. Instead, I have resisted you. Please forgive me. Sit on the throne of my life as I lay before you my old way of doing things and help me to live a life that pleases you. As you help me, I will wait patiently to see how you work through my trials. Thank you for the difference you will make in my life. Amen. 
Do you need to pray that prayer? In the Sudan today, Christians are being killed because of their faith. Men are lifted up on crosses in village squares. They're mocked because of their faith. Sometimes parents are killed by the Muslims leaving children on their own. In one town, the mullah said to this group of children, you must bow down and worship Allah, otherwise you're going to be killed. And there was an eight-year-old boy who said, I'm not going to bow down. And so the mullah gave the order and the little boy was killed. Because he said, my Lord is Jesus Christ. What inspires that kind of confidence? It's trust in God, his sovereign power, his providential love, and it's confidence that ultimately God will use all things, even terrible things, for good. There's one other thing I want to say about this verse, and that is Paul says this is a conditional promise. In all things, God works for the good of those who love him. This is a promise that's attached to those who love God. It's not a guarantee for everybody. It's only for those who love God. And the second thing he says is it's for those who are called according to his purpose. What does that mean? We're called to the purpose of becoming holy. He's more concerned with our holiness than he is our happiness, which leads me then to verse 29. God is working to conform you to the image of his son. For God knew, verse 29, his people in advance, and he chose them to become like his son so that his son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. There's a little word between verses 28 and 29 that explains the connection between these two sentences, these two verses. It's the word for. Why does God work all things for your good? Verse 28, because he chose you to become like his son. Verse 29, God doesn't promise you better circumstances. What he promises you is a better life. Jesus didn't suffer so that you would never suffer. He suffered so that when you suffer, you could become like him. And look again at verse 29. Paul says, God knew his people in advance. Some translations use the word predestined. I'm going to say a bit more about that next week. But let me just pause here to say Paul's primary purpose in this text is not to introduce us to a doctrine of predestination. He's just writing primarily to give Christians assurance. To explain what it is that God is going to do, what it is that is guaranteed by God to happen. And what is that promise? He says it is that we will be conformed to the image of Christ. The root word here is morpha. God promises to morph us. The moment you put your trust in Christ, the Holy Spirit invaded your heart and began to metamorphosize you, began to change you into the image of Christ. And i got to be honest, I am slow to morph. I mean, I love God, but I'm weak. And I'm resistant. I want to be more like Christ, but often I'm not. I can be very insensitive and cavalier to other people. I can be jealous of what other people accomplish. I can resent what other people did to me a long time ago. I can be selfish. I can be greedy. But I've got to ask the Lord to give me that desire to change. You remember Popeye the sailor? What did he say when he was frustrated? I am what I am. And sometimes that's kind of our attitude. I am what I am. No. You say, I want to partner with you, Holy Spirit in becoming the man that Christ wants me to be. Soren Kierkegaard said, And now, Lord, with your help, I shall become myself. In other words, God is changing us into the people he originally intended for us to be. He is working to restore that image of God that was defaced in us because of sin. And Paul talks so often about this process of morphing. I love Galatians 4.19. He says, I am again in the pains of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. That's kind of odd, isn't it? I mean, here's a man. I'm in the pains of childbirth. What is Paul saying? He says, I'm like a spiritual mother to you. You moms can identify with this. Paul says, I'm in the pains of childbirth. It's difficult, but I'm excited about what's going to happen on the other side of this. It's like there's this spiritual gestation process in which he's waiting for Christ to be formed within the hearts and in the minds and the spirits of those 
who are believers. So God is in the process of changing us. You know, he's still chiseling a lot of stuff away from me. He just keeps on chiseling. Well, I'm not the same man I was 10 years ago. I'm not the same person I was yesterday. I won't be the same person tomorrow because God is working in my life. And then at the end of verse 29, he makes an amazing statement. He says that Christ is the firstborn of, of many brothers, that we've been adopted into the family of Christ. We're being made into the family likeness. Now, in Roman society, when a man was adopted, a person was adopted, typically it was an adult male. When a wealthy man had a large estate, and upon his death he wanted to make sure that his estate was not just completely broken down, he would adopt somebody that he trusted, somebody who was close to him. And when he adopted that adult male, instantly everything changed. If that man had any debts, all those debts were forgiven. Instantly, the inheritance, everything the father owned was given to the adoptive son. It went from being temporary to permanent. It went from being distant to very intimate. God has adopted you and me into his family. We're brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ. He loves you just as much as he loves his own son. I love uh, Hebrews 2 verse 10. Listen to this. In bringing many sons and daughters to glory. Many sons and daughters to glory. That's us. It was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through what he suffered. See, God's in the process of bringing many sons and daughters to glory, but the preeminent son, Jesus Christ, had to be made perfect through what? Through what he suffered. Listen to these texts on morphing. 2 Corinthians 3.18, and we are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Colossians 3, 9 and 10, you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge of the image of its creator. Or Philippians 3.20, the Lord Jesus Christ will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. C.S. Lewis sums it up. Imagine yourself as a living house. God comes in to rebuild that house. At first, perhaps, you can understand what he is doing. He is getting the drains right and stopping the leaks in the roof and so on. You knew that those jobs needed doing, and so you are not surprised. But presently, he starts knocking the house about in a way that hurts abominably and does not seem to make sense. What on earth is he up to? The explanation is that he is building quite a different house from the one you thought of. Throwing out a new wing here, putting on an extra floor there, running up towers, making courtyards. You thought you were going to be made into a decent little cottage. But he is building up a palace. He intends to come and live in it himself. Third and final principle, God is in the process of achieving the ultimate morph in your life. The ultimate morph in your life. I want to give you verse 30 from two different versions. First from the New Living Translation. And having chosen them, he called them to come to him. And having called them, he gave them right standing with himself. And having given them right standing, he gave them his glory. And then the New International Version, and those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. God has a plan he's unfolding. And it comes in different stages. And I want you to notice just very briefly those stages. He chose us. He knew in eternity past those who by faith would respond to him. He called us. He invited us into relationship with him through Jesus Christ. He justified us. He declared us not guilty of our sins as we place our faith in Christ. And then finally, he says he glorified us, which seems really bizarre. He glorified us. Paul uses the past tense of glorified. Why would he do that? Shouldn't he say he will glorify us? You see, for Paul, he is so certain that God is going to do this, he treats it like an accomplished fact. It's already taken place. The purpose of God cannot be thwarted. God is in the process of conforming you to the image of his son, and he is going to see that process through. It reminds me a lot of Philippians 1 verse 6. 
being confident of this, that the one who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. God will continue to morph you. And it is again so certain in Paul's mind, he sees it as a fait accompli. It's already done. John and Betty Stem were missionaries in the early part of missionary work to China. And they were sentenced to death by the communists. And they were being led to their execution. And somebody said to John, John, where are you going? He said, I don't know where the guards are going, but we're going to heaven. That's how certain he was, how confident he was of his destiny in Christ. Sometimes maybe we think that we don't have what it takes to get to heaven. But you need to know that if you're in Christ, God has given you everything that you need. And there is no doubt that he will conform you to the image of his son and he will take you to glory. I talked this last week with a woman in another city who uh, is a believer in Christ. And she loves God. But in her early years, she left Christ and, and she began living a very sinful lifestyle. She started sleeping with a lot of different guys. And as she looks back on that, she regrets it so deeply because she knows that she left a part of herself with each one of those experiences and she knows that she wounded the heart of God. She knows that she's a child of God. She's repentant of that. She knows that she's saved. But she still struggles she still struggles with God's posture toward her. And she said to me, I know that God has a hard time forgiving me. I know that God has a hard time forgiving me. I thought about that. Is that true or false? It's true and false. It's true if by that she means that God can't just ignore sin. If she means by that that God can't just sweep sin under the rug, God can't just wave sin off because sin is so serious, somebody had to pay the penalty. Somebody had to pay the price. So in that sense, it is hard for God to forgive because it's only through the blood of Jesus Christ that anybody's sins could be forgiven. The price that was required was the cross of Jesus Christ. In that sense, it's hard for anybody's sins to be forgiven. But it's false if by that she means that somehow it's difficult for God to summon up enough love to forgive her. Nothing could be further from the truth. Nothing could be further from the truth. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. He gave his only son. That includes you. He loved you that much. He's not eager to punish. He's eager to forgive. It's not hard for God to summon up the love necessary to forgive. It's part of who he is. And so we need to live with that sense of confidence, God's love and his forgiveness. Jesus was arrested and put through a kangaroo court. He was stripped and beaten. He was mocked. And all things God works for the good of those who love him. Really? Really? And then he was taken by those Roman soldiers and he was nailed to a tree. And again, people came by and they mocked him. And he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And there was no answer. In all things, God works for the good of those who love him, really. But what if his prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane had been answered when he said, Father, if it is possible, let this cup be taken from me. If that prayer had been answered with the decision to withhold from Jesus the cross, nothing would work for our good. Nothing. If that prayer had been answered in the way we normally think of that prayer being answered, there would be no answer for our suffering. There'd be no answer for your suffering. You'd, you'd be all alone in your suffering. Holly and I would have to deal with the pain and the heartache of Hannah all by ourselves because there wouldn't be any God who could identify with anything that we go through. 
You'd be without any God who could identify with any of your hurts, with any of your pain. And if that prayer had been answered, there would be no answer for your sin. You and I would be destined to live apart from God for all of eternity. Because nobody would have paid the price for our sin. Nobody would have been able to make the sacrifice necessary for you and me to have our sins forgiven. We'd be lost. But the Father did not exempt Jesus from suffering. He did not exempt his own son from pain. He was made perfect through suffering. And because of that, there is an answer to our suffering. There is an answer to our sin. And God stands ready to forgive every sin in your life, every sin in my life, and he stands ready always to morph us into the image of Christ. In all things, God works for the good of those who love him? Absolutely. Absolutely. And if you don't know it now, you just keep trusting him, and someday you'll see it. You'll see that God works in all things for the ultimate good of those who love him, to those who are called according to his purpose. Don't stop trusting him. He's faithful. Let's pray together.